we're just glad that you guys are in the building today. My name's Randy. Um, I have the privilege of leading this incredible movement with my husband, Billy, who is actually not here today. He's stuck in an airport in Washington, D.C. Um, I know, crazy, right? He's been there like 18 hours. So pray for his espalda, his back. You know, you're welcome. Um, no, but I, I, I would like, you know, I had that same reaction. Oh my gosh. But I was like, you also get to, you know, not worry about my daughter waking up in the middle of the night. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, no, but I, I, I must say that it is incredible because, <clears throat> um, we had already calendared that I was going to speak this Sunday many, many months ago. And, uh, Billy was on a trip in Louisiana. And so it's incredible because even in the delays and even in the things that don't go as planned, God already had it all set up. He already had it orchestrated today. So for whoever, whoever that's for in the room, I don't know, but you may have had some delays, some cancellations, but the Lord already knows how he's going to work it out for you. Amen. <laughs> Excuse me. Hey, I'm really excited to be coming to you today, um, and I want to jump into scripture as quickly as we can. We're just going to continue in this idea of glory. Billy, two weeks ago, opened up really on the idea of glory, foundation of glory, and then he talked about how gl glory can come from the dirt in the second week. And this week, I'm going to speak to you on prayer in the glory. Some of you are all like, what? We're talking about prayer? I wanted you to tell me, like, prosperous, favor, blessings, that too. But let's talk about prayer today, Yes. Hey, so I'm going to just jump into the text with you right away. Mark chapter 9, um, verses 2 through 9. I'm going to open up in the ESV translation. ESV translation. So if you'd like, you can um, look at the Sky Bible. Pull your phone out. Use your, your regular Bible. Some of y'all have traditional Bibles in the room. Amazing. I love that. Um, we're just going to jump right in. Are you ready? Say ready. All right, let's read this together. Six days later... Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his three inner disciples. Um, there was obviously 12, but there were three that Jesus called up here. Uh, and it says, and led them up a high mountain to be alone. Normally regarding to prayer, this is what Jesus often did after a string of incredible things or a miracle, feeding 5,000, all that stuff like that. You tend to see Jesus retreat and kind of go up in prayer. And it says, as the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed. Next portion of scripture says, Peter, sorry, I got, there, there we are. And the clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. I would like that for my daughter's white onesies. Jesus, help me, because Lord. Uh, and then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. This is crazy, because, you know, if you've ever heard anything about any of the characters of the Bible, Elijah and Moses are like dead, so they shouldn't be here. This is very bizarre. Imagine sitting, you know, getting taken up a mountain to go pray with Jesus and people that you've heard about for hundreds of years are in front of you. That's scary, right? I mean, I see an ex relationship around and I run the other way. I cannot imagine someone who's supposed to be gone a long time ago showing up right there, right? So come up the mountain. This happens. And Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let us make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Verse Six says, he said this because he didn't really know what else to say, for they were all terrified. I love that they leave that in there. Like, it wasn't like he said that and they left it. It was like, no, reader, just so you know, they were scared back then too, okay? This was crazy back then too. Your fears, they're still welcomed in the room. God wants to meet you there, but don't, don't, don't stay away if you have a little bit of fear walking in, okay? I don't know who that's for, but that's for somebody. Then a cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said this is my dearly beloved son listen to him this is my dearly beloved son listen to him if we can even just get a glimpse at the heart of the father I think it's right here in verse seven because there are so many things that God could have said as to why we should listen to what Jesus is saying right I mean He's the son of man. He's the Messiah. He's the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's El Shaddai. He's, you know, you know, I could give you a list of reasons why we should listen to Jesus, but he says the reason to listen to him is because he's his beloved son. Okay, there's no, nothing else needed to be added to the roster, no other title, label. Just because he was loved, he was inclining that we should listen. I think that's a picture right there. Suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they only saw Jesus with them. Verse 9 says, as they went back down the mountain, he told them, speaking of Jesus to the disciples, not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. 
So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that the first Elijah must come? And Jesus responded, Elijah is indeed coming to coming first to get everything ready. Yet why do the scriptures say the son of man must suffer greatly and be treated with utter contempt? Verse 13 says, but I tell you, Elijah has already come and they chose to abuse him just as scriptures predicted. Can we pray? Thank you, Jesus, for this time. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have to be with one another. You hand selected who's in the room. I'm gonna, you know, let's just reiterate that the Lord, you hand selected who's in the room today. So whatever anybody came in with, whatever background they've come in, whatever belief system they had, would you encamp your love around them today? If they leave with nothing else, would they leave with an understanding that they are loved where they are right here, right now, in the middle? Would you open our eyes and ears to hear whatever it is that you want to say to us? In Jesus' name, amen. Can you say amen? Amen. Hey, when I was I was preparing this week for prayer and I was kind of asking the Lord, <clears throat> you know, what is it that you want me to speak on? And, and I, I tend to ask a few times because, you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes I doubt that like what he's saying, am I hearing that right? You ever been there? You're like, so... I'm sitting down. I tell Billy at the end of last week, I'm like, I really think I need to speak on prayer. He's like, that's amazing. I think you're, that'll be great. And, you know, and then I keep studying through the week and I'm like, well, who wants to hear about prayer? You know, I'm just being real. Can I be real? Y'all good? We good? Okay. I'm like, you know, prayer. I feel like everybody kind of knows how to pray. Like, you know, thank you, Jesus. Love you. Here's the things that are going on in my life. You know, would you help me in Jesus name? Amen. Right. Anybody else know prayer life is that? Um, <clears throat> that's what I, I've known most of my life. And so I'm back and forth with God. I'm like, anything else? He's like, no, speak on prayer. And I'm like, Lord, anything else? He's like, girl, I'm still telling you to speak on prayer. No matter how many times you ask, the answer's the same, speak on prayer. So here we are this morning. And this is a story and mostly, mostly known as the Mount of Transfiguration. This would have been like the Super Bowl of glory manifestation, okay? Because we're still staying in glory, but we're talking about prayer in the middle of it. And so this is one of those major moments, like y'all Bills fans, I can see you everywhere in the crowd. My goodness, thank you. Lord, that Bills Mafia gang is strong, huh? That's when you're supposed to cheer. I gave y'all the opportunity. Come on, amen. Thank you. <laughs> I, we used this in the first service. This would have been like the Bills playing the Cowboys in a Super Bowl throwdown. And this is it, y'all. It's about to go down. Halftime show, better than all the West Coast rappers coming together. Like, this is it, y'all. This is it. I mean, you have Elijah, Elijah, the prophet of all prophets. You have Moses, the man who was trusted to take the tablets of the Ten Commandments, and Jesus in his glorified state. Like, we don't need a Tupac hologram. We got Jesus' glorified state, you know what I'm saying? It, it's, it's wild what is happening right here. Now, when we're going to connect this thing to prayer, what we're really talking about is the ways that they entered into this state of glory. How do you get there? How do you find yourself there? How do you experience this? And I'm going to speak from this today, not in the sense that your prayer life is going to look like Jesus floating in a white robe. Okay? You pray, pray, sure, ask God if you want him to show up to you like that. I've heard stories before. I don't know, but I've heard stories before, all right? That's not what we're focusing on. We're focusing on what led up to this moment and what happened after the moment. Because I think a lot of times in prayer, we can get really excited for the mountaintop and the journey up, we complain, and the journey down, we're already stressed as if we didn't have a miracle right up top. So we could totally focus specifically on the glorification moment. But what I want to talk to you today is how do we get that glory in, in, in this space with you and I? in our personal lives, in our daily lives. And I think it has a lot to do, friends, with perspective. I think the way that you and I view God can be shown on how we approach him. It can be displayed on how we view him and what our everyday prayer life looks like. Miss Siri just called me out. Can somebody take this? <laughs> um, I think it can be viewed in our perspective. How we view God. And, and, and when I was preparing for this, just in the recent time, I was asking God, okay, how do you, how do you want me to explain this? This is what we do. We, Billy and I will sit down a few weeks before and we'll just spend some time quietly and ask God. And so my husband, he was gone this week, like we mentioned earlier. He's stuck at the airport. 
And so he was gone this week. So time alone was very minimal with my year and a half daughter. You know, it was great. She's awesome. But I was like, Lord, can you put her to sleep? (laughs) You know, and so I'm having a moment where I'm actually praying, getting some quiet time alone. And I'm, I'm waiting to hear God say this like magnificent thing. And he, I, I really felt and sense like he asked me like, do you want Atlas to go to sleep hungry tonight? And I'm like, no, like, come on, come on, God, you know that, you know, I love her. You love her. I mean, no, of course not. And then he asked another question. He's like, do you want her to go to sleep thirsty tonight? Like, no, can we get to the good stuff? God, like, you know, we, we've already got this covered. And he, and I felt like he kept, he kept asking all these questions about like, if I wanted her to be taken care of and I'm thinking, well, of course. And just in that moment, it was like, I heard him say, well, I, I want to do the same thing. And I don't know about you guys, but when I became a parent, and for some of the parents in the room, most of y'all, all of y'all, my whole life changed when I had a kid, okay? Very much changed. Completely different. Everything. The way I sleep, the way I eat, everything's cold. Coffee, cold. Not because I had a nice coffee, but because it's been sitting there so long. You know what I'm saying? Everything changed. My perspective on life changed. I'm worried about things I never used to be worried about. I'm thinking about things I never used to think about. I'm seeing things in a way that I never used to see things. Like my outlets were never dangerous. Now I have a kid, they're dangerous. You know what I'm saying? Like all the things, my cleaning supplies under my sink, great, not anymore. Everything has changed since I had a child. But I will say that the best thing about it, the perspective that has shifted the most is the way that I finally understand a little bit more about how God loves us based on how I love my child. Now, let me just say, you know, I like to think my love for my daughter is unconditional, right? You know, we like to think that with our kids. You know, but sometimes they throw a really crazy fit and you're like, Lord Jesus, if you don't come down right now, open the heavens up like you opened over this story, I, need, I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know what's gonna go down. And so if I even have those moments and I go, oh my gosh, I can't believe it, but I love her and I feel like my love for her is so magnificent and there's nothing that I wouldn't do for my child. And then to think that God loves us like 10,000 times more than that is jarring. I really had no concept of what love was and then this giant pocket in my heart opened and I had this little girl who keeps me up all night and somehow I'm happy about it, you know? But there was this shift in perspective of the way that I understood the way God loved me. And as I was sitting there, and as he's asking me these questions, my daughter comes around the corner, and she sits on my lap, and she's facing me, and as she lays her head down on me, he said, I will meet all your needs, but this is my favorite part. See, there's nothing in a parent, any of you in the room, that intentionally makes the decision that I don't want to meet the need of my child. Hopefully. If you do, We'll work with you. Let's talk after, okay? But there's nothing in us that really says, I want my child to go to sleep tonight with needs that I don't, that are unmet, on purpose, with every desire in me. There's nothing in you and I that says we want our child to go to sleep starving. We want them to wake up with worry. We want them to go to sleep dehydrated. We want them low. There's nothing in us that wants our children to go on to what's next with needs that have yet to be met. And that's the same way the father looks at us, but there's something beautiful about existing with him. And when we talk about prayer today, yes, there's prayer of petition where you write out your needs and you're believing for this and you're standing on scripture and you're speaking life over certain situations or you just found yourself in the middle of chaos and you kind of told God, if you do this, Lord, then I'll do this. There's that kind of prayer. But what I want to present to you today is the style of prayer where you exist with God and you have a certainty that your needs are met so you get to actually enjoy him. I don't know about you, but I have spent a lot of time in prayer asking for things, speaking so much that I never even give him a chance to speak so I don't hear him. Almost like I just over talk him, right? And I think that there's a shift that happens when you have a certainty that all of your needs are going to be met, but you get to commune with him. And I think over the years, we have overcomplicated scripture and overcomplicated prayer. One of the values here at Gospel is simplicity and not just in simplicity in the way that we do church. It's Sundays. We have a few groups throughout the week, and that's pretty much all we do as a church. We reach out to community. We do all that. But our focus is keeping things simple. 
But the idea that prayer might be simple is like confusing to some of us because some of you may have grown up in traditional homes or you may have grown up in really strong religious experiences where the way that you go to prayer is when you need something, when you messed up or when you're out of options. And I'm not here to tell you that God is not there for that, but I'm here to tell you that maybe he's here for more than just that. And here we come into scripture where you hear one of the greatest manifestations of glory and I'm going, okay, God, why'd you pick them? <laughs> what did they do? This is after a string of miracles that has ha have happened. I mean, you're talking about Jesus' encounter with the Seraphonician woman. She's a non-believer. There is Jesus who heals the deaf man, feeds the 5,000. He heals a blind man in Bethsaida. Peter finally confesses that Jesus is Messiah. And Jesus also foretells of his death and resurrection for the first time leading up to this and then they go up the mountain and he takes these three and I'm kind of wondering well I like I, you know what did they do there was 12 of them why were they so special you know thinking that there would be like this list of things that these specific three have completed that would give them access to this kind of glory so I'm looking at it and I'm reading before you're taught in Bible school, like read before, read after, read timeline. What's it about? Who are they talking to? You, all that stuff. So, you know, sitting there reading all this and I'm looking at it and I'm like, wow, they really didn't do much. I mean, they did, they did, they followed him, but that was pretty much it. So can I show you what they did to get here? Can I show you? All right, let's go back. Mark 9, verse 2. It says, six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. And the men watched Jesus' appearance and it was transformed in front of them. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain. So as we're breaking this down, I mean, he led them, right? So that would mean they had to follow him up the mountain to be alone. And the men watched and Jesus appeared. Okay. They followed and they watched. And then like the greatest Super Bowl of glory just happened. I'm here to pose this idea that prayer might be simpler than we think. That like the breakthrough, the freedom, the experience, it might be a little bit simpler because all these three men did was follow and watch. Can I just tell you today that prayer is simpler than you think? That all the experiences you have, traditions, being told it had to be done at this time, at that time, and you have to do this to be loved, and you have to do that, and you have to, th that prayer is so much simpler than we think. Three of the, like three of the greatest characters of scripture were manifested in front of people, and it was simply because they followed and watched. I think we front end all of these things that are going on, and we kind of, I don't know about you, but I've done this, I over talked God, you know? You ever got that friend that just like talks and talks and you never get a word in? You're like, I'm cool with listening, but man, you can talk. That's like me and Jesus sometimes. I'm like, Lord this, Lord that, Lord this, Lord that. You see him, you see her. What's going on with that? What's going on with this? And he's like, maybe if you just slow down, you could hear me, girl. You know, I, 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 that, that, that's what I kind of experienced this week. And as I'm reading this text, I'm like, wow. We really kind of complicated this whole thing. We really overwhelm people with how to get to God. We really confuse people and create these, loot, these um, barricades and these things to jump over and these mazes to get through when sometimes it's just follow and watch. Some of you are being challenged with something today and you want to speak. You want your side of the story to be told. You want your ground to be held. You want your outcome. You want your way. But can I challenge you today that maybe spending some time with Jesus and just following and watching what he'll do with the situation might be more powerful than getting our own hands on the situation. Something shifts when we watch. The Bible says that he works all things together for the good to those who love him. He works it together. Not me. I'm not this like supernatural team with God. It's not like it's Kobe and Shaq and you know, I'm like, God, I'll set you up. You just take it. No, he, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't. This is a crazy thought that some of you are going to go, what? But he doesn't need me. He wants me. He doesn't need me on his team. He wants me to exist with him. He wants me to follow and watch him. 
It's so much simpler than we've made it. There is so much noise that tries to distract us and pull us out and get us to not focus on prayer. But I think that this shift, what's going to happen today is that prayer might actually become an everyday thing for you. Would you look at that? Could you imagine that? That it might become a practice in our lives. I mean, imagine what our life would be if we spent five minutes a day existing with him. You know, this week, I feel like when you prepare a message, God's like, well, you got to go through it first before you really give it to anybody. You know, because I was ready to come up here and teach on prayer and be like, the power of God. And he's like, sit down and pray. And maybe I'll give you something to say. So, you know, just sat down and prayed. But it, it was like this moment where God was like, okay, let's see. So what did I do this week? And this is just a practical tip for you guys. There were many times throughout the week at the end of the night, Atlas will go to sleep. That's like free time. Mom's parents in the room, your kid goes to sleep. You're like, whoa, <laughs> you know, ready for the day. And so I go downstairs and I'm cleaning up the whole house. And normally I turn on like my podcasts or like videos or shows that I like to watch at the end of the night that I don't really have on when we have the kids around and all that. Uh, it's nothing crazy. Take it easy. <laughs> okay. Um, it, it's like reality TV show. It's not, it's not good, but it's not that, you know. So we're back and forth and I'm listening and I hear God saying like, just throw a worship music on. And I'm like, right now? I just gonna put me to sleep. Like I'm tired right here scrubbing the kitchen. Like you really want me to? And I'm like, okay, how am I gonna explain to people on Sunday that prayer is simple, but I just can't even switch like my entertainment for five minutes tonight. Sometimes changing your routine of prayer is like just being okay with switching your entertainment form one time a day. Sometimes it's literally saying I'm watching this, but I'm just gonna listen to one worship song right now. Not like five hours of your day and this. And it's literally like, just, I don't know, turn on a message like at one point. And this isn't to guilt anybody or to tell you how it should be or anything like that. But in my life this week, I can't, I can't even explain. I don't understand. I'm like, was this it, Lord? Like just once a day to just switch something out. I start my morning with prayer, but normally my prayer starts with Lord this, Lord that, Lord this, Lord that. And the moments that I switched out my entertainment this week, it was like, I'm just going to be silent. And I was scrubbing the floor of my restroom this week. You know, Mexicanas, we know how to clean. So don't even try me. My grandma will be proud. I'm scrubbing the floors, literally hands and knees. Forget the Swiffer, that don't do nothing. I'm on my hands and knees with all this stuff cleaning up. And, and God was like, this right here, this is the kind of prayer when you're asking and interceding. It's like scrubbing the floors. This is the, 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 the challenging part where you're putting in work. You're bringing forth everything. You're spilling it all out. But the prayer that's where you just watch and follow is where I actually just get to go into the restroom and it doesn't smell bad. Like I get to enjoy the work that I put in. I get to enjoy my house because it's clean. Like when you exist with God, when you're just with him because being with him is enough, it's like you get to actually enjoy the parts of him that don't complicate stress or give you anxiety. And I don't know, when, when I came to this thought this week, it was, it was really centered around, man, look at what God manifested in front of these men, all just because they were willing to follow and watch. Can we continue in the story this morning? So again, first thought is prayer is simple. If you're writing notes, you can go on there. I think even in that thought that prayer is, can be just existing with God sometimes isn't even a traditional thought right? Some of you have tradition or you were raised in a traditional household or whatever. And I think tradition is beautiful and it's to be honored for what it did in the time that it was, is, it was most prominent. But I think today tradition can kind of just become roadblocks for some people that have been traumatized by tradition, that have stuck to tradition, but missed out on God, have done all the traditional things, but never got the love that the tradition was supposed to bring. And I think that when we continue in this conversation, really lining up that sure, tradition is great, but let's see what happens when Peter tries to bring tradition into the room in this extravagant moment. Mark 9, verses 5 and 6, it says, Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Great, gratitude, love that, love that, Peter. I mean, I would be too, man, like... Elijah, Moses, Jesus, this is great. I want to stay right here. 
don't send me down this mountain, Jesus, because I'm great right here. So, you know, Peter felt the same way. Let me show you. It says, he said, let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He said this because he really didn't know what to say for they were all terrified. Yeah. I mean, he's like, let's just set up camp right here. Let me just make you a little house. I mean, I don't know that I would try to build a house for like Elijah and Moses, like these glorified, like how are you going to fit in? You know, there's all the, the technicalities. But I'm thinking like of all the things you can do, Peter was like, let's just stay right here on the mountaintop. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes there's, there's waves in life, right? There's good, there's bad. But when the wave comes and you're out the mountaintop, how quickly are we to just set up camp? As if God doesn't have more as if God doesn't have a continued plan. But he tries to set up camp. And let me tell you why. This is a reference to the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as Sukkot. And so this would be a memorial of the time of when Israel wandered through the wilderness, right? There was 40 years that Israelites were wandering through the wilderness. This feast is celebrated every year. You want to know what's wild? If y'all even doubt for a second, it's okay if you do, but let me just tell you this. I picked this text a week and a half ago. We don't really celebrate Feast of Tabernacles personally, anything like that. I don't really know much about it. I spent this week studying. Can I tell you that it starts today? Yeah, I, I promise. Hand on my iPad Bible. I had no, we had no idea, which is just, that trips me out. Okay, take that as you will. The Lord is tying things together, friends. Okay. So this, this would have been the reason that he would have sent up, set up those, those tents or those tabernacles for those three because that's what, how it was in the time. They would travel in tents through the 40 years they were encamped in tents. And there's even scripture that says that their clothes grew with them. So like the tabernacle would have been what, would have been what had provided. Like it provided the covering. It provided all this stuff. So this was the way of Israel's people celebrating the fact that God brought them out of Egypt and that he also protected them. So what does Peter try to do? He tries to build up a camp to protect them and to keep them right as they are. I don't know about you, but isn't that what we do? We like God answers one prayer. And we're like, let me box this thing up really quick. And I never want it to be ever messed up in the rhythm. I don't know about y'all, but like my daughter will sleep through one good night. And I'm like, I am doing everything the same that I did last night. You're even getting like one goldfish before you get in the bathtub. And you can pick up that dirty cracker that was on the floor when you walk there. If it means you're going to sleep 12 hours. You know what I'm saying? Everything the same to keep life like as steady as we can. And I think that's what Peter was trying to do. This is magnificent. Let me just build my own thing to keep this experience on a high so I never lose this feeling. I've come to tell you today, friends, that waves are going to continue. New Testament talks more about suffering than it does about sin, repentance, or anything else. There is this realization that when you come into communion with Jesus, that even though he's on the mountaintop, he'll give you glory, but he'll be with you when you go down and he'll be with you when you go back up and he'll be with you when you go down. We have no need to set an encampment, but can I show you what God does? The next verse says that there was a moment where he asked this question because they were all scared and he looks back and they were gone. But between the moment of him trying to set up camp and them being God, scripture says that a cloud came over and overshadowed them. Translation would have been like there was a covering. Like God was saying, I don't need you to build out of tradition because the reason that that tradition even exists is standing right in front of you. Doesn't that happen with us? That we try to make everything look and feel and sound right so that we can get God in front of us and then we miss out because we're so distracted putting this together, the fact that he's already right there. We get distracted with the noise and the chaos or the traditions of life and we kind of say, oh, oh let me, let me just, let me just, and then you look back and it's like the reason we even did this is so that we could get to Jesus and then we're distracted on doing the thing and we never actually get to Jesus. I think when your perspective changes on prayer, you're okay with your prayer life not looking traditional. When your perspective changes on prayer, you're okay with your prayer life looking different than your neighbor's prayer life. You're okay with getting into a rhythm that works for your life as long as you're getting with Jesus. Can I tell you, friends, 
I know that it can feel complicated following Jesus and you can feel like there's all these things to do. Whatever you do, pray, but I ask, don't do less. You don't have to do more in the beginning of your relationship with Jesus. You don't have to make it more complicated, but whatever you do, don't do less. You don't have to do more, but don't do less. You don't have to make it complex. You don't have to join a team yet. You don't have to get in a small group. We would love that for your life. But if that's overwhelming, let the baseline be prayer. Scripture says that if we are in a house of prayer, we're a den of thieves where we go in and we take what we want and we walk away from him. We go in and we say, God, if you do this and he does it and we take it and we walk away from him. We say, God, if you'll save my marriage, I'll come to you. He gives you an opportunity to save your marriage. You grab it and you walk away. I, I'm guilty. I'm not up here telling you because you did this or I know any of your situations. I'm telling you because I've done that. Can I pose this thought that one, prayer doesn't have to be traditional, but also maybe another prayer request is not the answer to the solution that you're looking for. You're like, what? No. Let me explain. I'll prove it to you. I don't know. I can think of many times where I was extremely stressed about what was going on in my life. And I told God, Lord, you know, I have this anxiety. I have this worry, which is great. I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm laying it down at his feet, but I'm more just kind of complaining to him, which he'll take that too, but I'm really not laying it down. So I'm telling him, Lord, I'm really anxious about this example, a job. I'm really anxious about getting this job opportunity. I want this job opportunity, Lord. If you make a way, I know that we're going to have this and we're going to this, and this is going to be great, and I'll give you glory, and you'll be faithful, right? Answers the prayer, get the job, get the better pay, get the better hours. Everything's great. Oh, my goodness, this is amazing. Two weeks later, little Johnny's teacher calls and something goes on. So where are you again? Lord, I'm anxious. I'm nervous. That's okay. That's fine. He wants to hear that. Like we said in the beginning, he wants to meet your need. But maybe the solution is not just a bunch of answered prayers. Maybe the solution is exchanging your time with a little bit of peace. Maybe the solution is a little bit more prayer. Maybe the solution is listening and watching and following. Because I have ended up in the seat where I just keep telling God, if you do this, if you do that, if you do this. And then he does it. And then I take him back there again as if he wasn't faithful for 28 years. And there's this shift that happens when you view prayer a little bit different. My, I, I pray that when my daughter, you know, starts to comprehend a little more, that for all of the days she remembers anything, she knows this, that her parents are for her. That's what I want. Uh, I, she will be loved and loved well, but I want her to know we're for her. We're for you being healthy, number one. That is my top priority for my daughter, is for her to be healthy. A, a part of my life, there was a lot of toxic relationships. My parents' marriage got really muddled. There was a really bad divorce. I've had really dysfunctional relationships in my family. All of these things. I worked through a lot of years of that. Narcissistic relationships, all that stuff. If you deal with it, if you give that, you're welcome here. Let's get some help. But let me tell you that I will, I refuse to be a parent my daughter has to heal from. I refuse... When I make decisions every day, as much as I want to give into myself, I don't want to be a parent that my daughter has to heal from. So I will reset, I will back up, I will give up, I will lay it down, I will be wrong a thousand times over if it means my daughter's healthy. So when we come to prayer, you have to know, and we have to know that everything that God wants to work together is so that you are aware that he's for you. Now, when you come with that truth, you're praying from something, not for something. Okay? Let me tell you, when you know that he's for you, you are praying from the truth that you are already loved. You are not praying to be loved. Does that make sense? When you, when you have an understanding that he's for you, you are, are really stepping into a new identity, that I pray from the truth that he loves me, that I'm his chosen, that he hand selected me, that I'm the righteousness of Christ Jesus. I, when I know all of that as truth, when I approach prayer, it's a lot different. You know, I, I do have a confession to make. Can I make a confession to you this morning, church? 
you can't forgive me, but that's only Jesus just saying. But, you know, um, I will say this. <clears throat> I haven't been to the dentist in a minute. You know, if you work with hygiene, bless you. I don't like you. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I like you. I'm scared of what you do. And, okay, so we moved here. I was pregnant. If you know this, you're not supposed to, like, they don't work on your mouth when you're, like, pregnant and stuff. So my daughter's a year and a half, so I'll just say that. It's been a minute, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you this. The reason I don't really like going is because every time I leave, I kind of leave, like, feeling worse. Like, my habits weren't enough. Like, the, like, you know, I wasn't flossing enough or I, like, need to add this into my regimen or, like, all these things that I wasn't doing right, and I tend to leave the dentist with shame, like, every time. Like, they pull that, they recline that blue vinyl chair, and they're like, open your mouth. And I'm like, you know? Because I feel like no matter what I do, it's still not going to be, like, up to, like, the glorious American Dental Association regulations. You know what I'm saying? But I think that some of us have a view like that on prayer. That we think that God is our dentist. I, you know what, what was, what's interesting is that every six months for the last year and a half, I've been getting a little card. It's like, hey girl, we're waiting for you. Come by and fix your whatever. And I'm like, thanks, toss. You know, six months later, hey, it's been a minute. And I'm like, yeah, I know it's been a minute, ma'am. I don't want to be there. And then, you know, again, it's been a minute. It's been a minute. And isn't that what happens with God? He's like, hey, I still see you. You know, it's, it's interesting because no matter how much shame I walk in with, all the dentist wants to make sure is that I'm healthy. You know, maybe I'll have a revelation this week and book an appointment. Pray for me. But I'm saying, like, isn't it funny that that's all the dentist wants is to make sure that any issues that are in your mouth that they can be taken care of. And, and, and I do know this. Show you're laughing at me because she's, <laughs> I love you. Um, she works in hygiene. <clears throat> What's funny is that what goes on in your mouth, if it's not well taken care of, correct me if I'm wrong, it can affect your heart. And so if we just take it a little bit further, the longer you wait with what's going on and what everybody can see, the, the worse that the trauma and trouble will be on where the places nobody can see. And so there has to be a shift where we don't see him like a dentist, where we don't see him like a boss, where we don't see him like a reprimander or, or like something of, of other, in a lane or label that other places have traumatized us. So there's got to be a shift where we understand and we fully believe that he's for you and I. He is for James, John, and Peter. He is for them coming into this incredible experience and all again that he had to do was follow and watch. I think prayer is simpler than we made it. I think prayer doesn't have to be as traditional and overwhelming. If that's your prayer life and you do it very traditionally, that's okay too. But there are people in the room that have been hurt and traumatized by the traditions that encamp around the Lord. And I just want to tell you that it doesn't have to look like that for you to experience the goodness of God. We're going to continue in this story. Um, and we're picking up in verse 9 and it says, as this is after speaking after the glory, all the manifestation happened. Jesus came out of his transfigured state, stood upright. They're going back down the mountain. And it says, as they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. As they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Now, just to break this down a little bit more, he's obviously telling them you can't, you can't, can't say anything. Keep your mouth closed. Some of us, that's just the hardest part. It's not following. It's not watching. It's just after we just can't stop gossiping a little bit. Just challenging thought. But there is something unique because he takes them down and he says, you know, you're not to tell anybody, but imagine this. Like, you know, some of y'all Bills fans. I, I walk up to one of you and I say, I got two field tickets to the Super Bowl of the Cowboys and the Bills. S sit on the bench with them if you want. You can go experience. Halftime show, better than all the West Coast rappers. I got it. You, Bills, sideline, let's do it. And, you know, if you're a Bills fan, you know, in the room, would you raise your hand if that, you would say yes to that? 
You know, some of y'all, I ain't a Bills fan, but I'm gonna go, you know. But I tell you, the only catch is you can't tell anybody you were there. Nobody. Can't tell your spouse, can't tell your kid who doesn't know how to talk yet. You can't tell anybody. Nobody. You can go, but you can't tell anybody. I mean, I don't know. I like to tell everybody. So I was at the Coachella Fest when Tupac became a hologram. I'm talking about it 10 years later. You know what I'm saying? I can't even keep that. Let alone the manifestation of Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. This is another part of prayer. That sometimes God wants to say something just to you. He just wants to speak to you. Sure, he'll give you a word. He'll give you an answer for what you're looking for. He'll give you something to share with somebody. But sometimes I think too often, for some of us, we go into prayer looking for like the next thing to argue about on Facebook, the next prophetic word to give somebody to make them feel good. We look for like the next answer for the relationship. Like we're looking and looking and looking. And sometimes God's like, yeah, I'll speak to you, but just hold on to that word for a second. Just for a second right there. And, and it's interesting because he tells them, don't, don't, almost like don't add this to your resume. Don't add this to another thing that it just becomes a list of great experiences. The third thing about prayer is prayer is not for your resume. Let, let me break it down. If you think about what a resume is, a resume is a collective of all of the things you have achieved, all of the work you have put in that would give you access opportunity or you would be deserving of a new position a new job a new this and I think oftentimes we come to the Lord in prayer and we write out the things we've done God remember when I did this God remember when I did that and then I listened to you here and then I did this can you please answer this prayer here's my resume Lord, I, well, well, like I, I, I was obedient that one time and I followed you this one time and I did all these things and then here, can, can, I have, can, I, can I have what I was asking for now? Am I worthy? Or we write up a resume and then some of, you know, some Christians walk around puff-chested. Listen to me. This is what I've done. I saw Elijah, Moses, and Jesus manifested. You have to hear what, you have to listen to what I gotta say. I go to church every Sunday. You can't tell me what to do. Oh, I pray every night. I don't need correction. Oh, I hear the voice of God. God's my pastor. I don't need a pastor. Oh, I, 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 you know, I have a diary. I don't need community. I'll just tell my diary everything. Because you have all this list of things that you've done and accomplished that would keep you out of what God actually has for you. Jesus explains how to pray in Matthew 6, and he says... But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. Then when he sees that our hearts are pure, that I don't need anybody else to see what's going on, yes, he's gonna get his glory. His glory is not dependent on whether or not we open our mouth. His glory is his glory and his glory will always be his glory. But there, there was something right here in Matthew 6 that shutting the door, canceling the noise that gets you distracted and pulls you out of prayer, getting away from the opinions and the labels and the begging God and all that stuff, just shut that door and exist with him. The best part of my relationship with my daughter, there's a bunch of things, but it's when I sit and she comes and lays her head and has no need in the world. There are parents in here of adults and you miss and hold on so deeply to the days that your child would lay their head on your chest. When they would roll over in the morning and they have the biggest smile at the first start of the day where they were excited to see you. They didn't need anything. They didn't want anything. They were just happy that you were around. There's a shift that happens in our everyday lives when we begin to exist with him. And the only reason that my daughter runs to me every time is because when she runs up to me, she knows mama's for me. Mama wants what's best with me. Mama loves me. Mama makes me laugh. Mama gives me peace. Mama puts me to sleep. She feeds me my food. I am everything that right at this point in time, she needs no one else but mom and dad. 
If she had nothing in the world, but she had mom and dad, she would be fully satisfied. If everybody else left and there was no one in our life, Atlas would still be so content with the fact that mom and dad were around. She doesn't care what house we go home to. She doesn't care what car we get into. She doesn't care what's in the bowl of food in front of her. Sometimes she does. But most of the time, you know what I'm saying? There's this beauty that all she wants is to exist with me. And I think God wants to commune with that side of Chautauqua County in this next season. Can I just prophesy that we're going to go into a season of prayer? That we're going to go into a season where we exist with God, where he can confirm to us things that we've been asking questions, that we can hear him, we can love on him, but we can lean back in the loving arms of the Savior, where we can sit at the feet. That song that we were singing, The More I Seek You, I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you and breathe. Some of you in the room haven't even been able to take a deep breath in a long time. Some of you in the room, the idea that God wants to give you peace in place of everything you have is out of reach. There's too much going on. There's too much happening. It's too crazy. It's too chaotic. It's too complex. Can I tell you today that there is no complexity? There's no chain. There's no relationship. There's no, nothing in the world that is too complex for the Savior who designed it all. And when you know that truth, prayer becomes something that you run to instead of away from, like I do with the dentist. You run towards that. You want to hear. You want to see what the things are that need to be adjusted. You have a desire to hear. And I think that there's a, there's, there's a truth in this story. When you see that, that all of this... M- m- this glory, I keep saying it, but there's this giant manifestation and all it took, can you say, was watching and following? Can you turn to somebody and say, follow and watch? Turn to the person you ignored, you know, and tell them, follow and watch. Follow and watch. You know, I really want to, I, I, I especially want to, follow, you know, my husband when he has maps on, you know, he has his phone up and you know, when you know where we're going. When I don't want to follow him is when he doesn't have the maps on. It's a bad, bad experience. It's very bad every time. I think he thinks he knows the area, but not very much, you know. And, and I, and there's, there's times where we're on our way somewhere and I'm like, Okay, you got the maps? You know where you're going? Yes. Okay, I'll jump in. Let's go. There's other times where he's like, hey, let's just, when we first moved here, we used to go to Point Gratiot a lot. And so he was like, let's just drive down to Point Gratiot. And I'm like, okay, sure. And um, we just know, like, go that way. And then you'll hit the water at some point, right? <clears throat> well, we did that one time. And we didn't hit the water. <laughs> and uh, I'm looking around and I'm like, oh, we're like, are we still in New York? (laughs) And we're driving around. We ended up driving for a lot longer because the map was off. And it all worked out. We got, you know, I'm here today. We didn't lose, get lost forever. But I, I, I I think when we have, I think we kind of give that dichotomy to God where it's like, if you know where you're going, I'll, I'll go with you. But God, do you know where you're like taking us? Sometimes for some of you guys, it may have felt like that. When situations in your house or family, marriage, relationships, school, jobs, all that stuff like that, there's this doubt and there's this question like, God, do you have your maps on? Do, do you know where you're taking me? I'll only go if you know where you're going. And what prayer is, is whether the maps are on or not. Because I know that you're for me, I'll follow you. Some of us in the room have walked away and distanced ourselves from what God can do, what God wants to do in your life, what he has specifically planned for you, because there's a question on whether or not the maps are on. And we're going to close here for a second, and I I just want to give you guys an opportunity, give us an opportunity as a church to, to recommit. 
And again, it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be wild and heavy. We're not going to tell you get up and you're going to have goosebumps and fall on the floor and start shaking. You know, if that's what you do, that's fine. The Lord's going to manifest how he's going to manifest. But that's not what it has to look like. There's some of you in the room that you have heard specific sentences in the last 40 minutes and you are jarred that it meets your exact need. That's God speaking to you. That's God thinking about the fact that you would be in the room and giving words to the person that's holding the mic so that you would know he's thinking about you. There are some of you in the room, you have heard the truth that you have been waiting for. You were about to buckle. You did not want to pray anymore. You were tired of showing up on Sundays. You didn't know how you were going to make it. But today the Lord has sent a word for you because he's for you. And I have a certainty in my spirit. I had so many other things that I was going to preach on that I thought were way more preachable. And he said, just tell them I am for them. Just tell them I am for them. So many of you walked in with a lot of things. Why do you think we sang that song? Ah, I'm in for like the fifth time. Because I can't, we can't shake the truth that he's for us. We're repeating it over and over again because there's people in the room who still don't believe it. Sometimes you sing because you believe and other times you sing until you believe. Sometimes you come into church because you had a great week. Other times you come into church because you didn't. Whatever way that you walked in the room today, I want to tell you that he's for you. He wants to see your prayer life manifested on the mountaintop. But he wants to see you sit in his lap when you're in the valley. And I, I just, I'm just close your eyes right here for a second. I feel like the Lord's doing something and bow your heads. We're going to pray this out and we're going to end soon. But there are some very specific needs that were met today not because there was a holy moment not because there was a hands laying on you not because you got goosebumps but simply because God sent words through a conduit hmm. remind them Jesus remind them Jesus He's speaking to some of you right now. Some of you feel something you haven't felt in a while. Some of you are feeling something you've never felt before. Come on, just, just take a deep breath, church. Some of you haven't had silence in your head in a long time. some of you I feel like the Lord is saying that someone has had white noise on in their head for a long time that there's not voices and there's not chaos but there's this sound that just won't go away you can never get to silence so that's someone in the room anybody feel just raise your hand at me if you feel like it hasn't been silent there's just been noise you can't get relief yep mm-hmm mm-hmm this kind of prayer, friends, that's for this. This prayer we're talking about, that, that's for these moments. You have a bunch of stuff you could say, but you just need silence. Can we just sit for a second, church? Just breathe him in. He's in the room. He's uh, draining. He just opened a drain in someone's mind. He's letting all that excess out. You feel the release? Breathe in again. He just like punctured a hole in a balloon and, and, and someone's feeling relief for the first time in a long time.
we're sorry for the thing we've made it. We're sorry that we have even created dens of thieves in our own minds where we come and take what we want and we walk away. Where we wait for the answer and you give it and then we run. Lord, we recommit today as a church that we will be a house of prayer. We commit today, God, that we won't go back to the ways of before. We will see you as the covering for today and for tomorrow and for forevermore. Holy Spirit, thank you, Lord. I feel like the Lord is is really leading. Um, there, there's some there's some people in the room that have um, <clears throat> you have been in your laboring season for a long time. Like you have been plowing to get to where you are today. You have been fighting tooth and nail. Every corner you turn, there's something that comes back around it. And just when you think you made it, the devil sends something else and he tries to take you out on your knees again, over and over. Doesn't matter how many corners you turn, no matter how much time you pray, doesn't matter how many jobs you apply to, you don't get the open door. There's something that's been in the way and you have been in a laboring season. If that's you, would you just, just wave at me? If that's you, you have been in a season where at every turn and at every corner, it is harvest season. Do you hear? It is harvest season. It is harvest season. The Bible says that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You are the few. You are the few. Do not grow weary in well-doing, the Lord says. Do not grow weary in well-doing. You are the few. We're going to open the altars after this service ends. And and if you feel like any of those things were relative to you, we're going to have the prayer team up here. We're going to leave this music on. We're going to turn the lights down. We're going to create an environment. I want to honor your time. And I want to honor what you're here in the room for. Um, But the Lord, he's moving still. On your way out, you can... um, drop your giving. If you, if today you feel like this was something you were supposed to give to, we have a whole moment of generosity that we're supposed to do. But if the Lord leads you and you feel like it, then listen, that's all we're saying. We're not asking. We, when we talk about generosity, we don't need your, your money. We just need you to ask God what you need to do. That's all. But we're going to pray and we're going to open this up and our prayer team is going to come forward. And I will challenge you, do not walk out of this room, friends. If there's a recommitment to this kind of experience, some of you are going to walk out with relief you haven't felt in years. No medication could give you, no therapy could give you, no conversation could give you. And I will challenge you, if you want that to be a sustainable life, don't walk out. Can we pray? Father, we thank you. Would you lift your hands in the building in your seats? God, we thank you for what you did today. God, we ask that you would continue to move, Father. We stretch our hands as a surrender. Whatever you want to continue to do in this building, in this space, we give it over to you, Holy Spirit. We ask that you would continue to speak to your people. Would people walk out today different than they ever did? Would this be a moment where we are marked forever? We thank you. We hand this over to you. We commit all this time to you. And we love you, Jesus. And we honor you, God, for all you've done. All God's people. Come on, would you say amen? Amen. Put your hands together, church, for Jesus. He's so good. He's so good. Hey, we have a, we have a, we do have a few things coming in the next few weeks. We've got, um, man, oh man. We have got, um, our Harvest Festival coming. We got a youth night. We're really excited. Um, Harvest Fest is, is really incredible because we're actually going to be able to partner with some local organizations, um, to feed some of the locals in town. We're doing Reed's Road Bags. If you guys know about it, it's um, about a little boy who was diagnosed with a terminal illness many years ago in our community. And um, the parents spend a lot of time in the hospitals. 
They didn't have a lot. They didn't have gift. They, they, you know, you eat takeout every day, your cafeteria food, you're brushing your teeth in the restroom sinks. You're trying to do all that stuff. I know that experience too well in these read road bags are to give to parents or people that have to be in hospitals for long extended stays. So if there's no other way you get involved in, involved in the Good News Fest, just we ask that you guys would contribute in some way towards um, the way that we're partnering with Partners in Kind and Reed's Road Bags. But we will end here because I feel like the Lord wants to keep doing something at the altar, but we want to honor your guys' time. So we love you, friends. We love you, love you guys so much. Would you continue to pray for us this week? We're going again to another church to continue to raise money for the building. Um, I want to tell this last testimony really quick, and then I'll let you go, I promise. Okay. Um, Billy was in Louisiana this past week, and uh, that's where he got stuck on the way home. And uh, he sat down with a minister from Paris, France, who was in town also at the conference that he was speaking at. And they sat down, and he's talking to him. And um, this man says he's trying to take a Jesus-centered, gospel-driven, simple church to Paris. Now, if you know anything about Paris and European culture, it's very different the idea of religion and sitting in these spaces is almost like kind of like a little it's interesting I won't I don't want to categorize or stereotype anything but it's it's a very different culture so when we heard those three words if you know anything about gospel we're a Jesus-centered gospel-driven simple church so Billy felt the need to sow and he was like he texted me and he said I don't know how we're like we're in a season of raising money ourselves We are believing for $260,000 and who knows how, but God is going to take care of it. So what are we doing trying to sow seeds to other people? And God said, put it in the ground and I'll take care of the rest. So we sowed. We sowed $1,000 to a church in France, believing that the gospel will make its way into Europe. And we were extremely nervous to be truthful. And he walked out and within five minutes of leaving the restaurant, Can I tell you that the Lord multiplied it by 10? And he got a text saying that a church in Louisiana is giving $10,000 to Gospel Church for the new building fund. If there's anything you leave today, that the Lord is going to continue to take care of the righteous. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging for bread. The Lord is breathing on what's happening here. So don't wait, friends. Don't wait. Amen. Okay, let's pray. Just stretch your hands. Lord, we bless them. We bless our people, their children, their children's children. Father, we ask you would be in marriages this week. Would your favor shine upon them? Would you be with them in their coming and in their going this week? In the midnight hour, would you draw them to simple prayer? Would you draw them into existing with you where you, where they have a certainty that their needs will be met, but they will come to you in a truth that you're for them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, church. We love you guys. Have a great week. We will see you next Sunday. Again, the altars are open if you feel like that's you this morning.